Whew. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. I think we'll let folks keep starting to trickle in. I know it's uh, sort of the five o'clock slot. I'm, I'm the guy between you and your beer. So I'll try to, try to keep this moving along. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, really quickly, my name is Lee Heyman. I am the director of new media technologies at the White House. Um, folks who saw uh, uh, Dries's keynote yesterday probably uh, heard Macon mention me. Basically, I uh, run all of the technical platform, all the development and operations of whitehouse.gov and about a dozen or so other sites run by the website and pretty much everything except for the content itself. Uh, so I'm basically yin to Macon's yang. He's content on platform. Um, that's kind of how that all uh, rolls down. So um, I always really get excited to come to an event like this to talk about what we're doing, what we're doing with open source software, user engagement and stuff like that. Because I think when folks think of government websites and government use of, of you know, online technologies, they, they don't typically think of the things that, that, are, that are getting talked about at the conference this week. And instead, you know, my guess is if you think about a government website, you're probably thinking something a little bit like this and a little bit less like that. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to those, uh, those sites uh, a little bit later. I just kind of want to run you through um, some ideas of, of, of how, we're, uh, how we're approaching things here. There's probably two main themes I'm going to talk about today. And the first one, uh, sort of, again, tying back in with a lot of the stuff that Dries talked about yesterday is about uh, engagement, about uh, engagement with the users of your site, in particular for us, its citizens, its... Um, you know, uh, fo folks who, who have business before the government, as it were. And so I'm going to talk, kind of run you through today sort of how we've evolved um, our platform, how we came to be using um, Drupal and open source software, and how we've even, how that's enabled us to kind of change the status quo within the government in terms of the use, the engagement, as well as the development methodologies uh, for these tools that we use and really talk to you today about kind of our marquee platform right now, which is We the People. You saw a bit about this yesterday. And, um, and, and go through and actually talk about the role that, that we're sincerely hoping that the folks in this room and at this conference uh, are going to play as we take this forward. So uh, our story starts in October of 2009. Um, does anyone know what happened in 2009 in October? Why it's important here today, anyone? Go ahead. Whitehouse.gov. Whitehouse.gov, what about it? On Drupal, thank you. Prior to that, yeah. So Whitehouse.gov was launched uh, on Drupal in October of 2009. This was obviously sort of a, a pretty exciting moment for us at the White House, but also uh, in the open source community. In fact, I don't know um, if folks were here last year. My, uh, my predecessor, a guy named Tom Cochran, was on the same stage talking about the process of getting getting whitehouse.gov onto Drupal and you know he kind of raised the interesting point that this is the only second time in the history of the country that a, uh, a presidential transition also involved building a new website and so they actually they, they, they built it wasn't the site the Drupal site that you saw initially but their first pass they did it from you know conception to uh, to production in about 70 days so um, but you know you heard Macon say this a bit yesterday where we talked about why we went to a platform like Drupal um, you know, the folks who'd come off the campaign and the, the you know, the, the, the folks who'd sort of been using web technologies prior to coming to the White House sort of had a new understanding and wanted to kind of change the status quo of what was, uh, of how the, the White House would use the web. And I think sort of previous administrations had much more of what we would all consider a, um, a 1.0 method, you know, mentality and um, in terms of just true production of content without real sort of, uh, you know, we speak, you listen kind of mindset. So we wanted to change that status quo with respect to engagement, but also, you know, relevant to this group here, it meant a sea change in our ability to develop. And a platform like Drupal sort of changed the model to where we kind of, you know, the things like the modularity and the ability to reuse uh, got us sort of developing and implementing faster and changing the model of of how we develop. So after we got uh, whitehouse.gov online, we started launching more sites. And with Drupal, we were allowed to iterate faster, get stuff up online in rapid succession, keep accelerating. And now we have, you know, over the course of the next two years, we launched at least four more sites. There's actually more that I'm not highlighting here. Each one, because we're on a platform like Drupal, because we have the modularity 
and the ability to sort of not have to build from scratch each time, we keep accelerating you know, each iteration. And so we sort of, the thing we used to joke about is like before Drupal, we had to, this is, you know, write an RFP for every new web form. Um, and it was a bit like that uh, because there's a lot of sort of that what we do here that is in a certain sense different, a new status quo from, from how things uh, were done in the government. And so the other theme I actually want to talk a little bit that you'll hear me kind of repeating on today is that there are some concepts that are um, probably pretty well established in the room here and to the community that we deal with that are still young concepts in the government and in the government web space. Um, and one of those is just a simple sort of uh, debate between, you know, folks would call waterfall versus uh, agile methodology. And I see folks nodding heads, I see folks understanding. Um, and a lot of the government procurement and sort of as it bleeds into the development methodologies are very much focused on, on waterfall. And I know there's a lot of people in the room here like who are like super bearish on, on waterfall. I imagine most, most web developers uh, sort of have a very dim view of it. But I will say, um, Having spent time in the government and sort of really conceptualizing this, there is a value to it. It's just not here for us in the room. And, and even in the software space, in the days of like, uh, uh, you know, shrink wrap software, et cetera, stuff, or when you had to like burn things out to, to tape or to, to, to FPGAs, things like that. I mean, let's think for a second what is sort of the, 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 the big feature of waterfall? Where does waterfall work best, right? It's in a situation where the cost of post-launch changes are very expensive. And if you think about sort of the majority of the government procurement and the majority of the government projects, this is actually a good thing, right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, um, but I kind of want my F-22 to be feature complete before it takes off, right? <laughs> so that's a good thing. But we all know in this room why it has a bad rap with us and our colleagues is because it doesn't work well in the web space because we know that's not, you know, not the best way for us to work because we know that the cost of, um, you know, the cost of post-launch changes is relatively low in comparison and in fact there's value to this and so, sorry, you know, that previous slide that I had there, these are slides that I use to evangelize about agile development within the government because it sort of takes along the x-axis sort of, you know, time and along the y-axis, the amount of value features, et cetera, that we're building into the application. And so by use of Drupal and by demonstrating over those two years that evolution of how we kept building faster and faster, getting more and more return on the initial investment on, uh, in Drupal and in open source, we were able to show that actually we don't need to like have all of the requirements written in stone and that we can actually go to sort of a more minimum viable approach, get some features out and start, you know, iterating through and continuing to add value as we sort of clip along that x-axis. And why that's important today and what I'm going to talk to you about is because now it enabled us to, to do one thing that had really never been done before. Um, beyond just using open source software, it opened up our space, both our, uh, our engineering resources and our financial resources to start no longer just simply being users uh, of open source software and Drupal, but actually starting to produce something. Um, and here's what kind of I want to talk about today, which is, um, uh, as, as folks know probably by this point, uh, September uh, of 2011, the president uh, speaking to a group at the United Nations General Council announced our new big new application. Um, and it spoke about two things. Obviously, it's an online petitions platform, and that means that people can petition the government. And, but he also said, we want other people to use this. He announced to a group at the United Nations General Assembly that we would share the code, that we would open source the technology. And this was a huge day for us, um, and it was essentially marked the change from simply being consumers to being producers. So September, shortly after the president makes that speech, we launch uh, We the People. Um, most folks uh, probably were at Dries's keynote yesterday, and he talked about sort of this, um, this platform. And I'm going to run you just quickly a little bit deeper through it and talk about what it actually does. Dries mentioned it's an online petition platform, uh, but this is something that's been around for a while. And Dries sort of said kind of amusingly that he was never really sure how he petitioned the government before this platform came along. Uh, the truth is, it actually uh, it goes goes much deeper than that. It even predates the internet. Um, does anyone know what the Olive Branch petition was? No, no history majors in the room. No, 
<laughs> All right, so the Olive Branch Petition was actually sort of the last, last thing that occurred before the, uh, the American Revolution, and it was a petition to the King of England at the time. So this idea of petitioning government is not new. And even the idea of petitioning governments or government groups online is not new. It's been around for quite a long time, and there's a lot of platforms out there that already exist. So why would we do this? when the space like already exists. Well, we decided we could actually change the social contract. We came into the White House and decided that we wanted to, to, to change the role. And so we committed and we said, if you get a set number of signatures in a given amount of time, you know, and meet all the other terms of participation, you are promised, you are guaranteed a response to your petition from someone within the administration. And in even a couple of places, it's been the president himself. Um, and so those slight sites that kind of what changed is that those sites that already exist, you know, I've sp spoken to people uh, at those organizations who equated the, the experience a little bit to uh, writing a letter to Santa Claus. Because what they would do is they would take the petition, they would gather up all the signatures, bundle it all up, and toss it over the wall. But what happened to it after that, you know, they really had no control over. And so now we have that, that, that new engagement piece. And so that's sort of like we're shifting initially now from um, simply just content production to an actual engagement experience. Um, and the way we developed that too was that we took that same new concept of agility and, and, and iterative development to the application itself. To where sort of when we first launched we had like the first iteration of the user experience and over time over the course of like the next year or so we started uh, iteratively improving the user experience. This sort of classic cycle of get it out there Look at the change in the user behavior. Let your users tell you how they want to experience this. To the point where we get this slow build and linear growth in participation until late last year, uh, we turned the curve of the hockey stick in terms of participation. And now, actually, even since this slide was put together, we've, uh, we've crossed 13 million signatures and uh, are roughly around 9 million users at this point. Um, also, the hockey stick metaphor, um, maybe it's me. Um, I, play, I play hockey, I play left-handed, so the hockey stick always looks like upside down to me. I don't know. Am I the only one who, who feels that? <laughs> so it's been so successful, you know, as folks know probably now that we have probably, we've, cro we've upped the threshold uh, for signatures. It now requires 100,000 signatures uh, in 30 days. Um, we think that's a good problem to have. And interestingly enough, we have not seen uh, a massive drop-off in the number of, of petitions that have crossed that threshold. So I think we're, we, we really have this sort of upward trending uh, continuous user experience. And so folks who uh, have experienced it have probably experienced this one. And you folks obviously saw this a bit yesterday. I was telling Dries last night. <laughs> yeah, seriously, right? There we go, all right. I fidget, I apologize. So yeah, no, I was telling Dries last night that uh, you know he stole my material, but yeah, I, ha I have to go with this, still doing that. Or is that just me? It is, okay, it's just me, all right. <laughs> Van Morrison can't play a concert without playing moon dance, like people will throw stuff at him. I can't talk about We the People without putting up this petition. But there's actually a lesson here. Um, there are a lot of petitions that are sort of not necessarily meant you know, we, we get some amusing petitions like this. How many folks actually have seen this? All right, so for like the three of you who haven't raised your hand, uh, I strongly recommend you go to your uh, preferred uh, search engine, do a search for White House Death Star Petition. It will be the most uh, interesting eight minutes of your day, I promise you. Um, but actually, folks who have seen this uh, before, uh, please, please raise your hands again. Let's get them up again. Um, and now, uh, how many folks actually signed this petition? Keep them up, keep them up. <laughs> Come on, I know, it's getting late in the day, let's stick with it. All right, hands up again if you've seen this. Now, how many folks who saw this learned something new? I asked Dries this question last night, he said he did too. In fact, we're not quite seeing it here, but we have data, so half of the folks who saw this petition, at least half, said they learned something new, who saw this response. Um, and here's the point that I'm making, which is that even though this petition was sort of meant kind of tongue-in-cheek, humorous, and so forth, it's sort of proof positive that we are committed to this endeavor, that we took it, you know, in, in, in kind and in seriousness, and even though it was humorous, and we got to sort of like show, um, show some interesting things, which is, you know, not the least of which that the White House has a sense of humor about 
you know, space, and I am not talking about the Jedi mind meld comment, um, but I am talking about, about this. So this is fused with metaphor, but all these numbers that you're seeing on the screen, and I get this because Dries doesn't get to have this, but he will. I'll talk to that in a minute. These are actually click-through rates for the various links in, uh, in the response, and so these are conversions. These are actual people clicking out, learning new things that they wouldn't have otherwise known if they hadn't uh, signed this petition. And so we do these uh, post-petition surveys to folks who, who, who sign petitions that get responded to, and this number holds up, and this is like whether we're talking about petitions about uh, you know, gun control, marijuana, secession, et cetera, you know, to each one we're seeing rates in the 40 to 50% range of people who, who signed this petition and regardless of the result of that response, have learned something new and have actually gotten some level of engagement from the White House that they wouldn't have already had. So uh, we consider that something of a success. And you remember the president kind of made those, those, those two, two promises, right? The first was that we would be able to petition the White House. But now we also uh, jump in August of last year to the next big exciting thing, which was the second half of that promise that the president made. Um, and so uh, I'm going to show you a picture of something that happened in, why does this keep, is it just me? All right. I asked for a uh, wireless mic, but they said no. Um, so August 2, so I'm going to show you a picture of, uh, of something really exciting, um, which is software developers wearing ties. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the folks in this picture are here at DrupalCon. They're in disguise. You know they're in disguise because they're not actually wearing ties, but tap them on the shoulder if you see them and, and, and thank them. But no, what you're actually seeing in this picture is the moment that the White House issued its first uh, GitHub commit, its first public GitHub commit. Um, that was the day that we uh, took the source code for, for We the People and put it online. And it was a really exciting day for us. We had our first pull request uh, within six hours. Um, we were the number one trending repo that week. Um, and you know it was such a success and so much support uh, we very quickly, within the next couple of weeks, released a bunch more, uh, at least two more, um, two more repos. These are our, uh, our mobile apps, uh, Android and iPhone. Um, and here we are today. We've actually got now uh, seven public repos. Uh, we have uh, merged in uh, about a dozen pull requests. And by that, I mean pull requests from, from outside developers, not our own. We, we have lots of pull requests from our own developers. It's part of our process, but actual sort of bona fide open source community pull requests. Um, 400 or so forks, uh, and um, now of course we have uh, petitions live uh, as a install profile on, on drupal.org as well. Um, and actually the truth is this is not even the beginning of our open source story at the White House. Uh, there are several uh, modules. These all showed up, um, some of these showed up in one of the slides that Dries had yesterday as well. Um, this is just a sampling. There's about a dozen or so modules, and I think uh, I was talking to someone. There's another one that's actually about to go up in the next week or so. Um, so these, the ones with the red stars uh, are stuff that even predated our petitions work, and these are modules that have been sort of in use on the White House um, and have been for quite some time contributed, maintained, um, et cetera. So um, the point here, though, that I'm getting at is that this is not just us checking off a box of open sourcing and just saying, all right, here's the source code, we're done, we kept the president's promise. It's like proof, you know, evidence that this is, this is a, an engagement level that we are committed to within the developer community, within the open source community itself. Um, and we wanted to talk too about some of the lessons, the experience of, of open sourcing, uh, uh, you know, what was the experience about open sourcing We the People specifically because, you know, we, like I said, we had some modules already gone live, but it was our first major application. Um, and the first lesson, yet another sort of topic that is um, sort of probably well established in this, in this room at the very least, I don't think it's fully established or taken as a priori even in the corporate space yet, which is that you get better software when you build for open source even if you're never going to actually release the code. Um, and we've come to kind of recognize this because petitions itself, I don't know if this is one of those cases when the president made that promise, if it was like, you know what I'm talking about, when the sales team promises something to the customer without actually checking with the engineers first. I, don't, I wasn't there at the time, so I don't actually know how it came about, but I do know that the, the, the platform itself wasn't, there was never initially the intent of, of releasing it as open source. Um, and so what the code looked like as a result sort of, um, you know, was different from what it looks like today and what it will look like tomorrow, et cetera, as we continue to evolve because we took that same 
uh, same approach. But we know now that we get this better, uh, better platform because of like we get flexibility, modularity, and that means that the way that we develop the code, you know, because we know it's going to get reused and because it's going to get adapted for certain things, the things that we require developers to do is very different. You have to be more strict about your abstraction barriers, about keeping your, your markup separate from your logic, things, you know, sort of basic engineering principles, making sure that you kind of are, are, are disciplined and, and rigid about the, the, the interfaces to your services, et cetera. And so we get that out of the box with open source, but also you just get better code because um, there's a guy, um, uh, at GitHub now, a guy named Ben Balter, used to be a Presidential Innovation Fellow, wrote this great uh, blog post about why you should open source, and he opens it with Justice Brandeis's uh, famous quote of, uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Because it's a simple fact that when you are writing code or doing anything really that you know someone else is going to see not just the end result, but the inner workings of it, you behave differently. And even if that person might just be five years older, you going, what the heck did I do? Well, you know, why did I do this choice? The, the way that you're going to code with that expectation is different, and it ends up with a more stable, more scalable uh, application, so by default. And this is a, a message that we're now trying to evangelize uh, throughout the government, and we have other folks on board with us. There's a, uh, uh, the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, which is sort of there, the latest startup space in the, you know, in, in DC, and they've already published a open source policy which is, it's really more procurement focused than, than engineering focused, but it basically, uh, it, it, it encodes this into an actual government policy that says you get better code. And so anytime they're doing a competitive procurement for, uh, for software, they uh, are essentially committing themselves to saying, if there is an open source option, we're not requiring that you go that route, but we are at least requiring that you consider the open source option in your competitive bid process. And so little by little, we're starting to make that known. And so again, this is, a, this is, a, this is an endeavor, an engagement that we're super committed to and excited about. And you know, like I said, the president said we were gonna do this. And what was the second thing he said, which was that other governments would, would get to use it. And so this is actually a petition site uh, that's that's been uh, being getting built in uh, Bulgaria, I believe it is, and so I don't know if it's online yet, but they're working on it. Um, so so we consider this something of a promise kept at this point. We have checked off all the boxes that the president said we were going to check off. You know, we can go out, drink our beer, go home, and done. And you know, I know you guys want to get to your beer, but the truth is. <laughs> <laughs> That's really just the beginning. You know, we all know this is really just the beginning. We kept the promise and we went to the next step. Where did we take it next? So, I don't know if folks know this, but uh, just over a week ago, the president issued an executive order. This was all very exciting in our space here. That basically says that all new um, government applications, platforms, etc., cetera, that, that use big data stores are, on the president's orders, required to have those data sets uh, open and machine readable by default. This, the statement goes on longer. It obviously addresses a lot of issues like privacy and stuff like that. But where legal, where you know, where feasible, we are required to do this. Frankly, it's something we've been we've been doing you know already for quite some time. Um, but why is this important? Why is this important for government websites? Why is this sort of a, a big deal for us to sort of commit and require this machine readability? So, um, well, for that, I'm going to go back to the slides I showed you earlier. Um, now, I, first of all, I don't want you to think I'm beating up uh, on, on these guys from, from Hawaii in particular, and you'll see why in a minute. But there's a lot of government websites out there like this. I'm just choosing Hawaii because, you know, the president is totally from there. <laughs> <laughs> but here we have sort of, I think, what you guys would think of as a particular... Uh, particularly compelling government website. You know, we've got our org chart across the top, we've got our, our, just our hideous font at the title, and then we've got this giant block of text that tells us nothing. It tells us what the folks who wrote this page want us to know about the Honolulu DMV. It tells you sort of, but it, but, but it doesn't address sort of, it doesn't answer the one question, the one question that you're asking, right? Why am I here? Why is a person going to be on this page? Why did they navigate through sort of customer service to licensing and permits division to get to this page about driver's licenses? Well, wouldn't it be great if we kind of could answer that question? Turns out we can. It's all right there, the data. You know, if we actually look at sort of search data, for example, figure out what is driving people to end up on pages, it tells us right there, why are you there? Hey, here's a hint. 
You're on the DMV website on a page about driver's licenses. You probably want a driver's license. And there's nothing on this page here that really tells you how to get a driver's license. It tells you what that, the only link in fact in here is a link to a PDF of a picture of a sample driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> when you get your driver's license, here's what it's gonna look like. So now we shift this and we turn to like sort of a more data-driven, user experience-driven model and it's like we do away with the, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the, the org chart across the top, as it were, and it's no longer the government essentially saying, this was actually done as a partnership with the, the Code for America Brigade, and so they took that search data and started to simplify it in looking at pages to answer the question, to address the user experience, to address why is the person on this page, to, to engage with the person who needs something from the government. And that's sort of like a big change, you know, for them and sort of, Again, like I said, I'm not beating up on the folks in Hawaii because they're taking this even a step, a step farther. And this is the new Hawaii.gov site um, to, to take them off the hook here. This is, I know it's got a very kind of Windows Metro look and feel to it, but what it does is it goes right to our sort of like user, user-driven experience. No longer government-driven, but citizen-driven. You live here, you have services that you need, we're gonna get you right to them. And we're gonna do it in a way that's easy for you to use, responsive design, it's gonna work on your phone, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, you know, I don't know if folks saw um, Jeff Eaton's talk yesterday, uh, but he was also talking about kind of the way to do this is to get sort of using APIs to uh, abstract your experience, the user experience from the content itself. So that really gets us to sort of like the next really interesting question that, that, that should be asked here today. What do you guys got cooked up now? What's what's the next next big thing? Huh? APIs for WhiteHouse.gov. APIs for WhiteHouse.gov. What in the heck does that mean? <laughs> glad you guys could share that moment. The president wants to know, you know. So I'm glad you asked, Mr. President. That is an excellent question. I'm glad you you asked that question. So. Folks who don't know, you probably, uh, this is a really exciting day for us in the government as well, um, probably don't know this, but today is the one year birthday of the digital government strategy. Now the digital government strategy was launched by uh, the federal CIO and CTO uh, a year ago today. And what it is, is it is set of, uh, a, a set of directives for uh, government agencies how they should approach uh, use of uh, online technologies, the web, open data. It was essentially the precursor to the executive order that I, I showed you earlier. But I wanted to call it out today because the first two directives, the very first two directives uh, in the government strategy, digital government strategy, speak of web APIs. Not once, twice. Twice. Because web APIs, we realize, are sort of the key to getting that space where we can start separating the content from the user experience and start looking at the user, uh, user activity and the user needs to start tailoring that experience to them. You know, and so with that in mind, uh, on May 1st of this year, uh, we launched uh, an API for whitehouse.gov. This is, uh, excuse me, for petitions.whitehouse.gov. And this is our first, um, you know, opening up the data, uh, high value data sets within the petitions platform itself to let people start, uh, start sort of going through that data to actually like start changing engagement models, engagement experiences, where we actually take the government sort of a step back and release that experience, let it go out into the community itself and let them dictate it. So this is a, uh, you know, an API right now, what you get with it is you can get data on uh, signatures on a given petition, uh, you know, data on all the different petitions themselves. There's a bulk down download functionality. Uh, we are working on getting uh, response data out as well, uh, like I showed you earlier. So Dries can now actually have a slide that shows the level of engagement in the Death Star petition. But before we started building this, this API, it took us quite a while because we realized this was like our first step into the space of APIs with uh, a major application at the White House. And we wanted to talk about, well, as with sort of the open source approach, we also want to look at what we do is going to set a standard for other government agencies. And we wanted to like lay it out and we knew that the API that we had to build um, had to be really well thought out and really sort of approached properly before we could get started to it. So we came to this notion of a facade pattern, uh, which is uh, written about by a guy named Brian Malloy, uh, who talks about it. It's basically sort of the three steps to building uh, a usable, a really effective API is first you essentially design your ideal API in terms of like specking out the space that you want, sort of you imagine like what you want your URLs to be and your query strings, et cetera. Um, and then you start building against it using mock data so you can actually start 
figuring out what the experience is going to be like. And then the third step finally is to like connect it into the back end and start start building out that way. That was sort of our first idea to have that to have that uh, abstraction barrier uh, going in that made it sort of a little more independent. So we're not tying all the methods too deeply into the back end. Um, and we also talked about uh, something else that Brian Moy spoke of, which is called pragmatic rest. Um, and I don't want to start any holy wars here into the conversation about whether whether rest is a uh, architectural style or a um, or a, an explicit standard or not. But we do sort of deviate a little bit from what folks would consider a com fully rest compliant standard, which is that we put our version numbers uh, in the path uh, and we allow for dot notation so that um, so that users can kind of tell, uh, you know, we, we, we honor sort of dotless notation as well if you put stuff in the header, but this is much easier because the idea, and this is where sort of the pragmatic rest and the facade pattern comes in, is that what we've been talking about, a lot of folks are talking about at this event is user experience, right? But there's also a question here, especially at a place like DrupalCon, which is the developer experience. And so if we measure the quality of an API, by uh, how fast and how easy it is for developers to, to start using and start building against it. I mean developers, outside developers who are going to you know, use it, not, not the folks building the API itself. And so with Pragmatic REST, we give developers these sort of intuitive tools to get started where you can even sort of like test your methods, uh, in, you know, just as something as simple as a browser. And so we came to these sort of like standards that we wanted to use to prioritize the, um, the developer experience. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, very explicit rules about the paths and the methods that we use. And so we, we separate essentially nouns from verbs. And we say that verbs may never ever exist in, in a path. That the only thing in the paths are nouns and like filters and those filters all go in query strings, right? And all the verbs happen in the HTTP, P, the HTTP methods. And, um, that's sort of the first thing that we said, and kind of I'll just give you kind of a counter example, which is like this is sort of what not to do with our API, which is to start here. You've got like you've got singular nouns, you've got you know a filter in that third third uh, third string there, and then of course we have we have a verb down there in a path. Um, and so why is this bad? Because you end up with sort of this vegetable soup, uh, vegetable soup alphabet. I'm going with vegetable. Um, you end up with a vegetable soup. <laughs> Of, of URLs like this that um, not only are hard to maintain, but it diminishes the developer experience. You're essentially prioritizing your own developers because in essence, you're sort of making it a little bit easier for the folks building the API to do that, but the folks paying the price are the folks, are your users, are your, your outside folks who are going to be building against this API. Because first of all, there's nothing intuitive here. And you remember we said the, the measure of an API is how easy it is for outside developers to use it. You know, I, every single method have to go and sort of figure it out, find the documentation, et cetera. Whereas when you have sort of a very explicit straightforward standard, I can start making inferences about other methods from, from the methods I already know. So it just, this becomes confusing, unmaintainable, and frankly unscalable because you sort of also from a QA perspective have a hard time knowing when certain API changes uh, will affect other, other methods. So, um, so we took these standards and we, uh, we put them on GitHub. Uh, we are evangelizing them as well within governments, but it's definitely not something that's exclusive to the government. So we welcome you. Please fork it if you go through it. Issues, um, it's on our GitHub page. Please send us your issues, your pull requests, etc. So we put together this great API standard uh, and started building it. And um, we thought we'd take it out for a spin. So in February of last year, um, something else really excited happened. We uh, opened up some applications and uh, invited a group of uh, engineers to the White House for a hackathon. Now, let me just stop for a second and ask you to imagine what the experience is like of trying to organize an event at the White House called a hackathon. <laughs> Once we got over that hurdle, <laughs> we invited a bunch of folks down. And the way it went down was we, like I said, uh, invited folks. Uh, we gave them early access uh, to a private data. They had about nine days of access to the documentation, the methods itself, gave them out keys. and essentially got folks together in the room to see what could start being built uh, with this API. And so I'm just going to kind of run you a little bit through um, some of the, the stuff that we found, things that we, uh, things, things that were built. Um, this is a, uh, just a simple kind of thermometer widget that folks built 
that uh, allows you to sort of track progress. So if I am, if I've created a petition and I want to promote it on my website, on my, uh, you know, on my Facebook, etc., I can throw a widget like this up and like show my friends and users, etc., how that petition is doing. Obviously, something quite compelling for uh, for folks who who, who want to drive this sort of engagement. Um, we also sort of have some demographic breakdown stuff. So this is stuff, folks. We have. I will tell you. I'm just showing you a small sample. We actually, uh, I'm going to give you a URL uh, at the end here that you can hit. There's a whole gallery of the different projects that happened at the, at the hackathon. But again, folks who deal with engagement uh, operations, folks who actually have campaigns and things like that, demographics matter. Um, you know, because you want to know sort of like what your constituency wants. We can actually use things like this to sort of essentially take the temperature of the folks in the various, various spaces. So this is, you know, we got a lot of ideas like this for like mapping, you know, like, like mapping regional behavior to kind of see sort of what, you know, what issues were important in various spaces. Um, word cloud of issues, et cetera. Again, this is sort of folks taking on uh, the idea of sort of pushing out to their own organizations, their own constituencies, sort of how to find new ways to sort of uh, garner participation in the platform, get folks to sign petitions, get movement, get action, call folks to actually engage and, and, and iterate with us. So that was the hackathon and, you know, like I said, we launched it live public May 1st this year. You can go check it out. You can start writing, uh, you know, writing your apps against it, your ideas. We are actually having another hackathon um, next week, in fact, for the National Day of Civic Hacking. Um, they're getting a little more comfortable with the term around the White House now. Um, uh, unfortunately, the application period is closed for that, but we promise you there will be many, many more, um, including sort of the part that is really the best to come, and Macon mentioned this yesterday uh, during Dries' keynote, but the best part is really yet to come. We have our writing, excuse me, our read methods in our API. We have the ability to start querying the data, downloading the data, etc. Um, but the game changer, we think, is that we are launching, going to be launching uh, right methods for that API. Um, we're starting work on the beta for it this summer. Um, we will do the, a very similar thing to what we did last time, open up applications, let folks kind of send us in their ideas, what they think they'd want to do with it, um, and then invite folks to come down to the White House to start, to start sort of playing, get, getting hands on with this, with this API. Um, but why it's so exciting? What is like the big deal here? This is the role, this is where you guys come in. This is where the folks at DrupalCon come into the game here because with this, with the right methods added to the API, those folks that I talked about, you remember the letter to Santa Claus metaphor that I gave a little while ago? This is where that changes, okay? We have said, okay, this, you have a platform. You already have your own petitions platform. You have a constituency that you want to talk to a user base established. Well, we're going to extend the social contract that we've already made out to you. That if you, with your platform and your user base, again, following a certain set of guidelines and rules, uh, connect your link in your platform uh, to our APIs, now you get to provide for your users the experience that you've already established that they want and that they're used to, and yet their signatures will still come into our database. So when this goes live, uh, folks will be able to build applications that will uh, you know, create signatures against our petitions, um, again, pass through uh, you know, whatever you want to do, whether it's an existing platform today or you start wanting to build a new one. This is taking the user experience essentially out out of our hands, you know, we are no longer saying, okay, we're the government, we are going to decide what your user experience is. We are going to say and acknowledge forthright that, you know, that folks who are passionate about, you know, social issues, economic issues, ecological issues, um, you know, may desire a different user experience from folks who, you know, are passionate about, you know, animal rights issues or gun control issues, et cetera. And so, you know, that space is already established Folks have constituencies and user experiences. Um, and then what comes next? Because this isn't simply just about necessarily existing online uh, petitions platforms, you know, but what's next? You know, we have ideas you can, you know, sign petitions maybe straight out of, out of Facebook or whatever the next social networking site's gonna be, LinkedIn, what have you. Um, you know, and then sort of even beyond that, like, you know, mobile stuff or in real life. I mean, we're talking about changing the user experience for folks, you know, folks of the demographic who sign petitions online. Now we're talking about, you know, changing the user experience of 
going shopping, right? What if we change the folks standing out in front of your supermarket with your clipboards and pens nagging you for your signature? What if now they have tablets in their hands, you know? And when you're signing this, they're nagging you for your email address instead of your signature. But all the same, now those signatures are going straight into, uh, straight into a platform where there is a commitment, there's a social contract that that signature, that email is not going just in blindly over the fence, a letter to Santa Claus, it's actually going to folks who have committed to engaging with the folks who signed that petition. So what comes next there really, that's up to the folks in this room. That's up to the folks at this conference. That's up to the folks that we want to engage with. And we are you know, excited and committed to see like stuff we haven't even thought of yet. You know, stuff that, that maybe you haven't even thought of yet. The stuff that we can do with this, you know, I still get chills when I talk about it. I think we think this is the key to the longevity of the platform. Um, you know, so to kind of tie it all together, this is an evolution that we've been through from that old single big block of text with the hideous font you know, around to actually shifting away from, uh, from simple content production and simply us driving the experience, driving the content. I mean, it's still there. We produce a lot of content all day long um, on the website, but it's just, this is changing to say, okay, looking at it from the perspective not of the government saying, here's what we feel we want to say to you, here's what we feel the experience should be like, and shifting it away from us. And each iteration along this step, you know, through that, that uh, improved um, development methodology, through reuse, through these improved applications, each step along the way we're increasing not just the quality of the experience, but we're also increasing uh, the return on taxpayer investment, frankly. That this, this is, you know, this is your tax dollars uh, being spent on, on, on evolving a process that's actually, like, you know, not simply that you're paying for code to get reused, which is awesome, you know, in and of itself because you're getting, you know, extra, extra value for that dollar, but actually this is being spent to uh, add value to the experience that you have when you, when you interact with government services. And this is something, obviously, like I said, we are committed to, uh, we, are, we are pushing, you know, and evangelizing throughout the government. And, you know, like I said, you guys play the role in this. So please, I welcome you. Um, check out our GitHub page. Uh, follow us on Twitter. It's WHWeb, White House Web. Um, these are our developers pages. Uh, Whitehouse.gov developers shows sort of the broad span of, of our open source uh, 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 stuff we've committed to. That is where you can see all of the different modules we've committed on Drupal.org, all of the repos in GitHub. Um, and then if you want to know stuff specific about the petitions API, uh, you can check out petitions.whitehouse.gov slash developers. That's where all the documentation is. That's where the gallery of the different projects are, um, et cetera. So honestly, and also email me. I mean, I want to know. I want to hear from you directly if, you know, if, 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 like, what, if you have ideas, if there's things that you want to do, you need help forking the code, please, like, give us, you know, let, let us know. So um, with that, I uh, really thank everyone for, for their time uh, and today. Uh, hope everyone's having a good DrupalCon. Um, hope you guys get the things, the food and the drink that you're after this evening. So um, I think we've got about 15 minutes here if folks want to want to have any questions. Hello. <laughs> so first of all, thank you because it was White House using Drupal that enabled my team to bring in Drupal to the federal agency that we support. So thank you very much for that. Can, can you say which agency you're not allowed? Um, DHS. <laughs> oh, fantastic. All right. Um, the other thing is we're working on APIs there. So I was curious about how or, or what technology you're actually using to run your APIs and how you manage data governance, like identifying your high value data sets. If you can so talk a little bit about that. That's still something we'll work in progress. We are, um, you know, the, the technology itself is stuff that we've built into. Um, built into the platform itself. I'm getting snickers because I've got engineers up front who actually know the answers to these questions. Um, but in terms of like identifying the, the high value uh, data sets, um, it, for the petitions platform specifically, it was actually sort of a lot more just intuitive because it was, um, you know, the, the folks that we would see uh, sort of asking us questions and sort of a lot of the press that we were getting around, uh, around the application was essentially folks doing things that you can do with the API, but doing it by scraping 
um, scraping the, the site itself. So it was very, pretty easy to identify the high value, uh, high value data in petitions. As we go forward, I think a lot of that is we're going to be looking at things like what are the, you know, what are the content types that, that, that folks are, you know, content that folks are after the most often. What are like, like I showed you in that, in that, uh, that Hawaiian uh, site is to like look at your, you know, first step is just look at search, search data. Look at what people are looking for. Why are they coming to your site? Thanks. Sure. And I can ask me more later about the specific technologies. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I have a bad question. Essentially, Did you say a bad question? I don't believe you. I, uh, what happens when the administration, a new administration comes in? That is not a bad question at all. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, it's one of my favorite questions. I get it every time. I, you know, I always hope that someone will ask it. Um, it's a great question. It is, this is, my answer is the API. This is the question we get pretty much more than anything else. The answer is, is the API and the right API specifically because it's our belief that when an ecosystem builds up around this, when, when folks like, you know, the NRA and, you know, the Sierra Club and so forth start building, you know, investing their engineering resources into this platform, like, it's not going to be something that the next administration can just turn off. Right, there's this social contract has to pervade because people are committed to it. Um, now, once we get these APIs out and rolling, it's not just the government being committed to it, but it's actually folks in the open source space, you know, committed to it. And it, it's there's too much investment to be able to just turn it off without without serious consequences. So my answer to that is is the API. So please start building apps. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, can you talk about the uh, biggest point of resistance that was maybe uh, encountered with the, either the API or the petitions project? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can say there was very little resistance to, uh, to the API. It's the, the only resistance really to the API was that we had a lot of, um, you know, there was still a lot of functionality in the site that we wanted to, to, to fix and, and and revise and improve. So it was the only real resistance in the API was sort of the kind of ever constant sort of debate of like which feature do we prioritize? And there were a lot of features that we wanted, but we kind of committed to the API itself. Part of the reason, like I said, is that there wasn't much resistance to, to, to building an API is because, you know, we have directives from, you know, from the administration to start building APIs. And that's a very compelling, a compelling tool to have in your back pocket. Um, in terms of resistance to the, uh, to the petitions platform itself, it, it's the responses, honestly. It's like folks were really worried about what sort of things were going to get, get petitions and get, you know, what, what, were, what were, essentially, what were they agreeing to? And they foresaw a lot of, a lot of situations. And frankly, some of those are situations that, that have transpired, but folks, um, you know, are committed to that engagement and, um, you know, and are taking it sort of with the, with the import as expected. And so, you know, I think it's okay to, folks were worried about being called out on the mat on, on some specific issues. And, you know, frankly, I think that's our obligation to, to call call folks out on the mat. And so it's been, and I think the folks who've been in the administration responding to these petitions as well have actually find it a really positive experience. And we've had at least a few, you know, a few instances where these petitions have, you know, ha have changed, changed minds here and there. And, you know, there's been at least a few small policy changes that have, that have come from them. Anyone else? Yeah, hi. Uh, Can, do you mind? You know, here's a mic here. I, I know they're recording. They want to get the camera, the questions on. There's one, yeah. No, no, hey, no problem. There it goes. Same as me. All right. It's not just me. Ask the question, I'll repeat it. I'm trying. You mentioned looking at search data mm -hmm. uh, as a way to get started. Um, tell me uh, more about how the big ideas come about. Um, just like what else do you look at besides search data, for instance? You know, I wish I, I, I wish I could give you a better answer. It's not not really the, the, the part of the project that, I, that I'm involved with. In fact, there's, yeah.
Yeah, there's also a, a great um, site uh, at uh, data.uk, British, and they actually talk about kind of design principles and sort of they look at some ways to help. Because it's really also can be very, uh, uh, you know, site-centric, specific in terms of how, you know, what your methods for identifying high-value data, but they, they talk about sort of some concepts of how to, how to look at those high-value data sets to, to identify. Apologize, I can't give you a better answer than that. Have, have you guys considered um, publishing the revision logs of like whitehouse.gov? Because um, I think for historical research years down the road, that would be really nice to see the, the progress of the narrative that like the White House would um, pro like show on its website. Um, and right now it's up to libraries and digital archives to basically scrape sites and, and find out what that is, but they only get small snapshots of that. And I would think that that'd be a really good model too for uh, like legislation to do, like even like post legislation through GitHub, so that you could see revision models and stuff like that of the actual documents themselves, who touched them, whatnot. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I'll uh, I'll sort of try to take it in order. Um, when just really quickly, when you said uh, re revision logs, you actually mean the revision of the content, right? Okay. Unfortunately, I can't sort of say uh, too much about that. Like I said, um, I'm the platform guy. Uh, the decisions about sort of how that happened um, is the, the guy with the, you know, you saw on stage or on the screen yesterday. Um, but no, I do agree with you. But the question about sort of like things like, like putting, putting um, you know, uh, putting legislation on GitHub, that is a um, pretty much constant. Like I, I can't think of a, of a meetup I've, I've been to, especially like, you know, in the DC space of like, that is a wouldn't it be awesome if idea that we've had. Um, and it's out there actually, I don't, it's not at the federal level, but I think that they, um, uh, the city of the District of Columbia actually just put its code, and code, sorry, in the, uh, in the legal sense, not the software sense. So the actual like laws of the city of the District of Columbia, I think are now on GitHub, or at least they're in the public space. And so as they evolve, I think that's gonna happen. So I, we all want to see that happen, and I think sort of if I had to sort of, I, I really don't sort of like know like the future of that content directly. I think those are great ideas. There are also sort of, um, there are laws that sort of require certain things and prevent other things. Um, the Presidential Records Act, I can tell you, is not not an easy burden to shoulder, and that's sort of every, every piece of communication that I have is governed by that. Um, so it's not an easy question, but it is, I think there are a lot of, what I will say is that there are a lot of folks sort of in this technical space, a lot of really, really smart folks uh, in, in DC working in the government sort of who do have these ideas and are committed to, 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 to iteratively getting to places like that. Anyone else? Thanks everyone, I really appreciate it. Um, got you guys out of here five minutes early and uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of the week.